and welcome to People's Dispatch. It has been two years since the countries and the governments of the world are discussing pandemic treaty at the World Health Organization. The idea is to come up with a negotiating negotiated draft or a text which can guide international response in event of a future pandemic. It also talks about prevention uh, because it is talking about monitoring of pathogens, some of them dangerous pathogens, and a strengthening of health systems because that would ensure that the epidemics do not spread in case we are able to respond timely and effectively. Um, however, while these seem to be in intention, stated intentions at least, when we look at the details, the way the negotiations are going at the level of international negotiating body, which is the place where uh, the governments come and talk and discuss before uh, coming up with the final text. Uh, when we look at those negotiations and what is happening, um, one cannot feel very confident that uh, things are running in a manner which can really help people um, avoid the kind of devastation that we saw uh, of life and death during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but there are also countries and activists and civil society organizations who are at it uh, to put a better language in the text uh, so that uh, things can be more pro-people and um, where access, affordability uh, and availability of medicines and other medical tools can be available uh, for people when they need. Uh, also important is to discuss a little about the World Trade Organization and what is happening at that level. We all know that uh, India and South Africa had proposed uh, something called a TRIPS waiver uh, at the WTO, basically asking that all kinds of intellectual property barriers should be lifted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, because uh, that was becoming a barrier for developing countries, uh, especially the uh, least developed countries, in accessing technology uh, to manufacture and distribute some of the products which could save lives. Um, uh, subsequently, 65, 65 developing countries came on board and sponsored that resolution. Um, however, uh, it was passed, uh, some of the clauses uh, were passed in a very um, half-hearted manner, very late. Uh, and now it seems that uh, the news is coming that uh, uh, finally the WTO will not be able to um, give TRIPS waiver uh, to medicines and uh, other technologies. Um, so in uh, when we look at this entire scenario, it is important to see that uh, it is only at the level of WHO now that we have the pandemic accord, uh, which can give some hope. The, of equality and justice uh, when it comes to pandemics. Um, so these are the things, this is the theme around which we will ha uh, uh, have our interview today. And we are joined by none other than uh, K.M. Gopakumar, who's a legal advisor with the Third World Network, an organization which has been following these processes at the level of WTO as well as WHO very closely and um, uh, being a strong voice of uh, pro-people policies and language that should come in the text. So welcome, Gopa. Uh, and we have had you before, and uh, uh, it, has, it is always a pleasure to have you. Uh, so maybe firstly, we can talk about uh, uh, the International Negotiating Bodies eighth round, which is going to start on 19th Feb, and it is going to go on till 1st March, uh, which, which is quite a long time to discuss uh, a negotiating text, um, which means that there is an intent to try to close this uh, within two years, which is this year before the World Health Assembly in May. Um, but uh, we, uh, but what kind of information do we have from the seventh round, which happened uh, in December? Uh, and uh, do you think that uh, uh, issues such as access to uh, medicines or access and benefit sharing uh, system, all of these, where do we stand in, uh, in terms of uh, talking about those issues? Thank you, Jotsna, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, interaction. <clears throat> As we have seen in the last round, that's the seventh round, uh, which was uh, like a uh, two phases it happened in November as well as in December. Um, what we observed is that um, uh, there was a, a whole uh, uh, clamor for equity uh, you know, in 2020 and 2021, and which in a way uh, uh, gave fuel to this idea of uh, a pandemic uh, treaty. But as we uh, progress, 
I think the push for equity uh, or the steam uh, is losing out and uh, developed countries are showing their real colors. Uh, what exactly they want as of now uh, is that a concrete legal obligations uh, for enhancing surveillance network and sharing of information. But at the same time, they are not ready to uh, provide a legal guarantee or a, uh, not ready to undertake legal obligations uh, to uh, bring equity uh, in the international health regime, uh, international health emergency regime, especially in the context of pandemic. So uh, what uh, we mean by equity is that to take a concrete obligations to provide <coughs> equitable access uh, to the uh, equitable access to health products uh, in every countries by and large through the diversification of uh, uh, manufacturing base so uh, all the regions all the countries who do not have the uh, manufacturing ability, uh, capabilities can produce these medicines and uh, other uh, required health products can uh, access these products and which can enhance their ability to respond well so far uh, they can you know uh, uh, what you call contain the spread of the pandemic <laughs> but uh, developing uh, developed countries are saying that you know um, uh, they are not in a position to provide any kind of uh, legal guarantee so that is what uh, we have observed and um, uh, though the uh, there is an ambition or there is a push uh, to conclude the whole negotiation by May, uh, it is a fact that uh, we do not have a an draft uh, formally uh, a designated negotiating text. We are still working on a draft negotiating text, and uh, the seventh um, INB decided that they will uh, create um, around five uh, subgroups to discuss various issues, and the subgroups will then uh, the, the uh, uh, will provide a textual language to the bureau and then from there bureau will develop a new text so this kind of attempt we have seen it and which has failed which has in a way delayed the whole negotiation uh, till date because it prevents the right of member states to provide uh, uh, language or provide textual proposal uh, to the existing text so if such a propo uh, uh, such a uh, uh, textual proposal comes, of course, it may enhance the volume of the text, but everybody's views are recorded in the negotiating text, and that will set the stage for um, uh, yeah, starting a negotiation, so a text-based negotiation. Um, so uh, till date, there was no text-based negotiation. The discussions were by and large happened on concepts and ideas. And uh, now the time is running out. There will be a clamor from developed countries and associate, uh, their associate uh, to have a treaty by May. So there is no point in having a treaty without a content. So rather, it will uh, bears the danger of reinforcing the status quo. As we talk about you know, uh, decolonizing global health, this will be a uh, to that kind of efforts, and it will rather um, reinforce uh, the colonial uh, uh, idea of uh, global health once again. So that's the danger we are facing right now. Well, so so that's important. And uh, in a sense, you are saying it is better to not have a text than a heavily compromised text, which will not really help uh, people uh, access uh, medicines and other medical tools, right? Uh, I'm saying, yeah, it's not the text. I'm saying that uh, it is better not to have an uh, not to have an uh, pandemic in, uh, legal instrument which uh, does not uh, uh, change the status quo. Absolutely. Uh, currently, the text, uh, what is proposed is that developing countries has to undertake more obligations, but there is no guarantee that uh, uh, to uh, get any kind of assistance. And as well as in return of providing all this information, developed countries are not ready to uh, part the benefit of that uh, information that is in terms of uh, sharing the uh, uh, health products required uh, for the preparedness and response to the pandemic. Right. 
Um, so maybe uh, one good example is uh, uh, the access and benefit sharing system of what uh, what you're saying. It gets, I think, best exemplified uh, through that. So can you talk a little about uh, uh, that as well? Uh, so normally the dominant perception uh, is that whenever developing countries are uh, demanding for equitable access, uh, it is always, you know, viewed as a charity. Oh, uh, uh, the countries have the developed countries and their entrepreneurs has this uh, 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 ability to develop products. And why they part with uh, the products with the uh, uh, developing countries or in a, uh, other words, developing countries are demanding too much. They are eyeing for the scale uh, by demanding equitable access. But that's not the uh, truth. The truth is that without accessing those information, uh, the development of such products uh, will be delayed, if not possible. So everybody contribute uh, to the development of this uh, uh, you know, R&D of, uh, uh, of uh, these health products uh, uh, related to uh, whether it's a pandemic, uh, you know, uh, what you call a, a pandemic or uh, public health emergency of international concern, every country who faces that uh, infect, uh, outbreak shares a lot of information uh, through WHO uh, to other countries or even sometimes uh, directly uh, posting uh, you know, the data uh, on websites, etc. So this information is critical uh, to develop. And further, many of these uh, pathogens also uh, various types of variants occurs. So you need to have access to those information that helps you to develop a uh, robust product. So this has been completely ignored. The idea uh, uh, or the what is going on right now uh, is that winners takes all. We get this information, we develop the products, but we don't part with you. So this is unacceptable. It's the only way or the uh, or if not the only way, but the best way uh, to do that to have an uh, legal regime which ensures uh, uh, access to information along with the benefit sharing. So what is happening right now, even on the ABS provision, so <clears throat> uh, the uh, latest proposal of the European Union, very clever way, uh, want to create an obligation on countries to share the information and provide access to the pathogens. Uh, which uh, emerges in their uh, borders or located or isolated uh, uh, within their borders. But when it comes to benefit sharing, there is no such legal obligation. Quiet about yeah, it. yeah. It, it is there saying that, okay, you sign the contract, etc. But access is not depending upon the uh, uh, the condition uh, uh, for, uh, you know, access is not depending upon your obligation. Benefit sharing. To share the benefit so in other words uh, um, you know ac access is unconditional it is highly a colonial approach to say that you provide access and we don't share you the benefit and when it comes to benefit sharing you have intellectual property rights and then we will uh, have a um, um, uh, we will have a uh, other uh, conditions attached to it that okay so that's not acceptable so uh, the uh, the European Union proposal clearly reflects uh, that mindset. Thank you. Very very important. Yes, and and the fact that how colonization is still continues in this negotiations, I think these are important linkages to be brought about. Um, uh, uh, talking about something similar, the way the pressures work, uh, uh, when the INP7 happened in December, just before the second round was to take place, Geneva Health Files uh, broke a story, very important one, uh, which uh, said that, uh, which revealed that uh, the negotiator from Namibia, who was a very strong voice uh, from the global south, was asked to return to the country and not negotiate. And that happened under extreme pressures uh, by the US and EU. Um, so can you throw a little more light on it? And do you think that uh, these kind of pressures are common in these negotiations and developed countries do such things tactically or more commonly and it, it wasn't really an aberration? Or how do these negotiations, the back door in, this, in the sense of the negotiations work? I would say that what we have seen or read uh, uh, in in December, uh, in December 
is a kind of a cut and riser. But as we close to the uh, more and more uh, towards the uh, uh, you know deadline for the negotiation, so we will see uh, more of such pressures. Um, so developing country, typically a developing country negotiator faces two types of pressure. Of course, one from and the developing uh, developed countries and another from the secretariat. So secretariat's views and uh, their opinions always favors or most of the time favors uh, the views of developed countries. So you do, you do not get an objective answer most in most of the time. So a developing country negotiator faces uh, two uh, or types of opponents. One is the developed countries and another is the secretariat itself. So it's a very, um, very, very, uh, uh, what you call uh, um, uh, tough uh, environment they are working. Um, a secretariat is supposed to provide a neutral view uh, and even and uh, taking into consideration of larger public good, but that's not the case. Um, and uh, as we go along, we will see uh, these pressures are building up. I think the, uh, there will be two types of pressures. One is that countries will be ap uh, approached, capital will be approached bilaterally by US or EU. And second, uh, to say stop. Uh, the second uh, types of pressure is that they will provide more funding for some small projects or other projects and say, uh, uh, hey, now you are getting it. Why are you uh, 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 negotiating these provisions? So we are resolving it bilaterally. So this kind of tactics are um, well known and uh, we expect more. That is exactly uh, what happened um, even in last in 2022 uh, when um, IHR was uh, uh, a proposal, US proposal on IHR was taken up. US they approach all the capitals from uh, important capitals of developing countries and ask the support. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, pressures uh, will be there uh, yeah but the again uh, the way to stand such pressure is that more vigilance uh, by the uh, public health groups as well as uh, the civil society uh, organizations right um so uh, one uh, when we talk about intellectual property we talk about uh, access and benefit sharing system uh, there is one more category which is very important and that is uh, talking about the health workers uh, because in COVID-19 we saw uh, while the health workers were the backbone of providing all the support, uh, be it the frontline health workers, uh, community health workers who went in among the people and uh, provided support or be it the nurses or the ward persons and doctors uh, in the hospitals but the kind of harassment they faced they had to deal with extremely long hours uh, of work and still they were not paid on time forget about uh, uh, being paid some bonus for the work that they were doing um, so in that sense where does the text stand today and what can be the demand uh, from the health workers and uh, their organizations and unions um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very important uh, uh, issue and uh, the draft negotiating text has a dedicated article to deal with the uh, uh, health and uh, uh, care wor uh, workforce, article 7 in the draft negotiating text, which has around four paragraphs, uh, which basically take care of the uh, uh, issues what you have mentioned, safe working environment and uh, access to, um, uh, you know, uh, goods and services uh, which is uh, uh, required to um, uh, perform their duty in a better way and also there was a commitment to assist develop uh, assist developing countries uh, to build the healthcare workers and also an obligation to invest in establishing sustaining and coordinating and mobilizing skill and trained workforce also to uh, an obligation it proposes to create institute uh, a network of uh, training institution at national and regional uh, 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 level and also uh, to centers of expertise to strengthen and sustain skilled and uh, competent public health health and care workforce so these are uh, these provisions are there but the most important question who is going to provide financial resources for to establish such institutions and also to developing uh, assist developing countries so here 
uh, you, there is an obligation is created in all parties to assist developing country parties. It should be very clear who 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 is uh, who has the major um, uh, uh, responsibility. Yeah. It's very clear those who are having the financial means and technological means have the, that's the developed countries. Okay, so here uh, putting this developed countries are abdicate developed countries are abdicating their resp uh, historical responsibility, um, uh, which they owe, um, uh, you know, uh, from a global uh, public health perspective uh, to developing countries. They are abdicating it. Okay, I, it should be very clear this article. The responsibility should be with the developed countries as well as WHO. Right. Now, this brings me to my last question, uh, which is uh, now that the negotiations are beginning and after the February negotiations, again, we have the ninth round before the World Health Assembly, which is also a long round. Uh, what do you think should the developing countries be doing at this moment, uh, looking at the text and uh, do we have any expectations or what do we expect the developing countries uh, to do? I think developing countries uh, needs to convey the message very clearly that uh, we are not interested in a treaty for the sake of it. We need a treaty which uh, changes the status quo and addressing the concerns on equity effectively. So that should be the bottom line. And uh, I am sure they are capable of doing it. The, uh, there are uh, uh, cross regional support for the issue of equity. And even developed countries also knows that they have to give something on equity, but the uh, the the effort is to minimize that, extract maximum and give uh, minimal. So uh, and therefore the pressure will come in in terms of like oh, oh early harvest. Let us negotiate equity provisions later, not now, and uh, let's have the uh, uh, let's have the um, uh, the uh, uh, the legal instrument by May. Um, we will resolve all the issues later uh, because there is a um, uh, U.S. election is coming. U.S. election, if uh, Trump wins, uh, U.S. may uh, move out of WHO. Therefore, we need to have a uh, the legal instrument at the earliest. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, campaigns or uh, you know arguments may put it up. Um, to convince developing countries to make a compromise. But that may, uh, kind of compromise would be disastrous for developing countries because they would be ending up undertaking obligation which goes beyond their uh, means and also not getting anything in return. So, uh, so thank you, Gopa. Uh, I, the main takeaway is that we need a legal instrument which uh, uh, puts the language of equitable and just... Uh, uh, accessibility uh, in very core form and if that is not happening we do not need this legal instrument uh, we should continue to fight for a better one uh, that is a takeaway thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights with us